Welcome! This is one of the hardest and yet most fun types of videos to make. And if you're wondering why I am dressed in such a way and half painted, this is because today we're going to discuss upper limb supply, our arm and forearm and ham arteries. Greetings! We are going to review upper limb vascularization and innervation. This is a left upper limb, including hand, forearm and arm, placed in an anatomical position. We want to see the paths structures form as they follow their course. So, let's draw the arteries and nerves from proximal to distal and the veins from distal to proximal. And, before we start, how are you going to orient yourself without the bones, right? Here we go! Done! Since blood must arrive before it can leave, let's start with the arteries today. Blood leaving the left ventricle through the aorta will have three possible branches in the aortic arch. One of them is the left subclavian artery. All the upper limb supply is going to come from branches of the subclavian arteries. After giving rise to the left vertebral artery, the subclavian artery changes its name just before entering the axilla, after crossing the lateral margin of the first rib. What name would you give to the major artery crossing the axilla? So, now we have truly penetrated into the upper limb with the axillary artery. Let's forget all the branches for now. You won't remember each small branch if you can't visualize the overall shape in your head. So, we will start with the major arteries and go into deeper details later. Blood has to reach the hands, which means we need arteries traversing both the arm and the forearm, and arteries tend to be deep within the tissues. In the arm, we will have just one. After sending some local branches, the axillary artery becomes the brachial artery. Brachium means arm. And many languages still have words for arm close to Latin, such as braço. Regarding the forearm, however, you surely have noticed you can palpate your pulse both medially and laterally on a wrist. This implies we must have arteries on both sides. And since the artery arriving at the cubital fossa is the brachial one, we can deduce the brachial artery divides into a medial artery over the ulna, the ulnar artery, and a lateral artery over the radius, the radial artery. Thus, you already know two arteries arrive. A less experienced student might imagine these two arteries with which supply a portion of the hand, like what happens with the median and ulnar nerves. Still, Vessels have one major advantage over nerves, they can anastomose. Why have each artery supply a portion of the hand if you can fuse them together and have both irrigate all the hand? This way, even if you temporarily lose either the radial or the ulnar artery, a vasospasm and an electrogenic lesion while collecting blood, a cloth, you will still have the other one potentially supplying all of the hand. But why settle for good when we can have great? What could be better than one anastomotic arch between the two large arteries in the hand? How about two anastomotic arches, a deeper palmar arch and a superficial palmar arch? And then, from these arches, you will have a pair of small arteries leaving for each finger. Okay, so subclavian artery, axillary artery, brachial artery, radial and ulnar arteries, palmar arches. You've got a basic idea. Let's go deeper now. Of course, these arteries need to give off branches along their courses to supply the many muscles and bones of the upper limb. So, starting with the shoulder, the axillary artery is going to give off six branches. 
the superior thoracic artery, the foracoacromial artery, the lateral thoracic artery, the anterior circumflex humeral artery, the posterior circumflex humeral artery, and the subscapular artery. Don't despair, because we're going to go one at a time. The superior thoracic artery is highly variable and present in only 30% of the population. Despite originating from the axillary artery, its origin is quite proximal, and it will go downwards and medially to anastomos with the internal thoracic artery and superior intercostal arteries, and supply the anterior thoracic wall, including the pectoralis muscles. The foracoacromial artery is called this way because it's going to send branches both towards the thorax, the pectoral ones, and towards the acromion of the clavicle. Thus, it's going to supply both the deltoid with its acromial branches and the pectoralis muscles with its thoracic branches. If you want to be technical, there is also a clavicular branch for the sternoclavicular joint and the subclavius muscle. Additionally, the deltoid branch may arise from the acromial branch or directly from the foracoacromial artery. The lateral thoracic artery goes downwards and is easier to remember by its other name, long thoracic artery, because then you are reminded of the long thoracic nerve and can associate it with the serratus anterior muscle. Aside from the serratus anterior, the lateral thoracic artery will also supply the pectoralis muscles and the subscapularis muscle, as well as axillary lymph nodes and the anterior thoracic skin. Bear in mind, it can either be a direct branch of the axillary artery or a branch of the foracromial artery. Yeah, I know. There is a lot of variability in these branches of the axillary artery. But without going into too much detail, think as a general rule that these arterial branches that course medially might contribute blood supply to structures such as the breast and by anastomos with the internal thoracic artery. The anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries, as the name circumflex suggests, will wrap around the surgical neck of the humerus and anastomos with each other and the profunda brachii, suprascapular and foracoacromial arteries. This is also why surgical neck fractures of the humerus may damage particularly the posterior circumflex artery. They will then supply the deltoid, teres major, teres minor, as well as the glenohumeral joint. The difference between the two of them is that the anterior circumflex humeral artery gives off an ascending branch for the head of the humerus, and the posterior circumflex humeral artery gives off a descending posterior branch for the triceps brachii muscle, long and lateral heads. The subscapular artery arises on the inferior margin of the subscapularis muscle, at least this is intuitive, and goes posteriorly before dividing into a foracodorsal and a circumflex scapular branches, and anastomosing with the suprascapular, dorsal scapular, and intercostal arteries. Since it's one of the few branches that go posteriorly, you can deduce it will supply mostly muscles of the posterior compartment. Deltoid, latissimus dorsi, triceps brachii, long head, subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres major, and serratus anterior are counted amongst its contributions. 
Great. Moving to the arm. In the arm, the brachial artery is going to devolve four branches. The profunda brachial artery, nutrient branches to the humerus, the superior ulnar collateral artery, and the inferior ulnar collateral artery. The large number of arteries with collateral in the name should give off. They will flow parallel to the brachial artery. The profunda brachii artery is a posterior medial branch of the brachial artery that courses with the radial nerve along the radial groove of the humerus until splitting into the radial collateral branch and the middle collateral arteries. As the name suggests, it's deep. Since it's so deep, it's going to supply the bone, the shaft of the humerus, as well as the posterior arm muscles. This is done through an ascending deltoid branch for, guess what, the deltoid muscle. This one will anastomose with the descending branch of the posterior circumflex humeral artery, as well as muscular collateral branches for the lateral and medial heads of the triceps brachii, and the nutrient artery of the humerus for the humerus shaft. The radial collateral terminal branch will wrap around the lateral humeral epicondyle to supply a couple of flexors of the forearm, the brachialis and the brachioradialis, as well as the radial nerve, the intermuscular septum, and the overlay skin. After all, someone's got to supply the anterior compartment as well, right? After that, it will anastomose with the recurrent branch of the radial artery. The other terminal branch of the profunda brachial artery is the middle collateral artery, which is going to anastomose with the interosseous recurrent artery, but not before supplying fascia, skin, and the enconeus muscle. The nutrient branches to the humerus of the brachial artery may be present in addition to the nutrient artery of the humerus that emerges from the profunda brachii artery. Once again, anatomical variations are commonplace in the upper limb and cannot be completely disregarded. Despite what the name may suggest, the superior ulnar collateral artery originates from the brachial artery and travels along the ulnar nerve towards the ulna before it anastomoses with the posterior ulnar recurrent artery. The inferior ulnar collateral artery, on the other hand, anastomoses with the anterior ulnar recurrent artery. Together, they supply the elbow joint and the inferior ulnar collateral artery additionally aids in the supply to the brachialis, biceps brachii, and coracobrachialis muscles. Finally, in the forearm, the radial artery is going to generate eight branches. The radial recurrent artery, the palmar carpal branch, the dorsal carpal branch, the superficial palmar branch, the deep palmar branch, the first dorsal metacarpal artery, the princeps pollicis artery, and the radialis indices artery, as well as minor muscular branches. Meanwhile, the ulnar artery is going to originate the anterior ulnar recurrent artery, the posterior ulnar recurrent artery, the muscular arteries, the common interosseous artery, the palmar carpal branch, the dorsal carpal branch, the superficial palmar branch, and the deep palmar branch. The radial recurrent artery, as the term recurrent tells, makes a 180 degree turn and goes backwards towards the arm, which makes sense since it's going to anastomose with the radial collateral artery, a branch from the profunda brachii. It contributes to the supply of the elbow joint. 
Then we will have a pair of carpal branches and a pair of palmar branches. There is a palmar carpal arch and a dorsal carpal arch, as well as a superficial palmar arch and a deep palmar arch. And each of these four arches is going to have a radial branch and an ulnar branch. The palmar carpal branch, fortunately the names are helping us now, is ventral, anterior, palmar, and anastomosis with the palmar carpal branch of the ulnar artery and the interosseous arteries to form the palmar carpal arch, which supplies the carpal bones and their joints. The dorsal carpal branch also seeks the wrist to anastomose with the equivalent dorsal carpal branch of the ulnar artery and form the dorsal carpal arch. The superficial palmar branch contributes to the predominantly ulnar superficial palmar arch and the deep palmar branch provides the major supply to the deep palmar arch. The radial artery also contributes branches directly to supply the first two fingers. The first dorsal metacarpal artery supplies the thumb and index fingers. The princeps pollicis artery is the major supply of the thumb. And the radialis indices artery also supplies the lateral aspect of the index finger. There are also many muscle branches to supply the muscles of the lateral forearm. The anterior ulnar recurrent artery is, from now you know exactly what you expect, is going to turn 180 degrees and run proximally anterior to the medial epicondyle, contributing to supply the elbow, the brachialis, and the pronator teres, and the anastomos with the inferior ulnar collateral branch of the brachial artery. Meanwhile, the posterior ulnar recurrent artery is going to turn 180 degrees and run proximally posterior to the medial epicondyle, contribute to supply the elbow and the anastomos with the superior ulnar collateral branch of the brachial artery. The many muscular branches will be sent to supply the medial and central forearm muscles. The common interosseous artery is one of the most intuitive ones. As the name suggests, interosseous between bones, it runs distally over the interosseous membrane between the radius and the ulna after emerging in the distal portion of the cubital fossa. It quickly divides, though, between an anterior interosseous artery and a posterior interosseous artery. The anterior one will supply the radius, the ulna, and the deep forearm flexors, whereas the posterior one will supply the forearm extensors. Makes sense? It's so deep it crosses the interosseous membrane and becomes posterior. The posterior interosseous artery is also going to give off the recurrent interosseous artery. The palmar carpal branch crosses the carpus beneath the flexor digitorum profundus to anastomose with the palmar carpal branch of the radial artery to make the palmar carpal arch. The dorsal carpal branch, aside from giving off a small branch for the ulnar side of the fifth finger, anastomoses with the dorsal carpal branch of the radial artery to form the dorsal carpal arch. The superficial palmar branch is the greatest contributor to the superficial palmar arch which anastomoses with the superficial palmar branch of the radial artery. And the deep palmar branch 
provides a small contribution to the G. Palmer Arch, formed primarily by the G. Palmer branch of the radial artery. Oh, and there is also the hand. The superficial palmar arch is going to be mostly ulnar, with a contribution from the superficial palmar branch of the radial artery, whereas the deep palmar arch is going to be mostly radial. The deep palmar arch will primarily supply the carpal and metacarpal bones, the adductor pollicis, the dorsal interosseae, the lumbricals, and the radiocarpal joint, through three types of branches. It is going to give off palmar metacarpal arteries for metacarpal bones, metacarpophalangeal joints, and proximal interphalangeal joint supply. They then anastomose with digital branches from the superficial palmar arch. The perforating branches anastomose with the dorsal metacarpal arteries communicating the deep palmar arch and the dorsal carpal arch. The recurrent branches supply carpal bones, intercarpal joints, and the radiocarpal joint before anastomosing with the palmar carpal arch. You can see there are lots of connections between the palmar and carpal arches. Meanwhile, the superficial palmar arch is more involved with the phalanges and phalangeal joints through the three common palmar digital arteries for fingers 2 to 4. They give off branches to anastomose with the palmar metacarpal arteries from the deep palmar arch and afterwards each common palmar digital artery splits into two proper palmar digital arteries. These proper palmar digital arteries will then give off branches to anastomos with the dorsal digital arteries, supply the phalanges and interphalangeal joints as a soft tissue, and finally anastomos with each other. If you got this far, congratulations! You are definitely not afraid of anastomosis. And so, that was that. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. I hope this has been useful. If you are interested in medical review videos, maybe check my playlists on things such as congenital heart disease or OBGYN, or maybe my question resolution videos if you are interested in practicing. And if you speak Portuguese, Maybe take a look at my Portuguese channel. Thank you for choosing to share your time with me, and I hope to see you on the next video.